Welcome back to the interview. I'm Gene Morano. Our guest is Morano City Police Chief Chris C. Perkins. And uh, Chief, one of the things I wanted to bring up is you're an alumnus of uh, some very impressive sounding uh, academies of the Virginia Institute of Forensic Science and Medicine, the Professional Executive Leadership School, and the National Criminal Justice Command College. I know you also went to the National FBI Academy. How did all that prepare you, prepare you for what you're doing now? I think the two that prepared me best uh, was the National Criminal Justice Command College. Uh, that's a venture between the University of Virginia and the Virginia State Police um, and the FBI National Academy. And it was the leadership training uh, that I received during that that has just been amazing. Uh, the forensics uh, is good to help me relate to various aspects of our department and the work that's done. And uh, the Professional Executive uh, Leadership School was just an outstanding program put on by the Virginia Chiefs Foundation and uh, the University of Richmond. So all of those working together gave me a perspective uh, that uh, you know I wouldn't have had otherwise. And so it was the leadership training out of that and then the actual forensic training helping mm -hmm. me understand you know the different aspects of what we do. Are you are you a big believer in training for the guys in the ranks? The, oh, absolutely. The people in the ranks. Absolutely, and I think the city has com shown that commitment uh, that that I want us to have by providing us with a you know multi million dollar uh, facility that's state of the art, and uh, we've we're bringing training in. You know, since that academy opened. Uh, in May of this year, uh, 13,000 man hours of training has taken place there. In the new police academy. In the yeah. new police right. academy. And I think that training translates to a better police officer and a better service that we can provide our community. Mm -hmm. And I, since you brought that up, I know that there was something recently where, which is still under investigation, when an off, officer kind of ran off the road during a chase and you came out with a statement. And one of the things you said was, mm -hmm. was that whatever comes out of this, whatever teachable moment comes out of this, you want to go back into the academy to get feedback to people is Absolutely. that immediate feedback is that something you know relating it to things that are actually happening is that will that make a better police officer uh, it certainly will I mean though behavior modification in this case is going to be required that training aspect of it is going to be the most important you know we had a police officer in 1992 in similar circumstances crash into a building and died and that officer's name is now at the police memorial. And I think that's a significant impact on young officers when they come through the academy and veteran officers when we go through in-service training. And we show them that we have policies in place to prevent that. And not only for the safety of those police officers, but for the community at large and you know, for the property that belongs to that mm -hmm. community. We, you know, we, we are vested with a great deal of authority and that training is paramount in making sure that we manage that well and we understand and are accountable for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, you know, that's, the training is gonna be beneficial. The, the, the trick is, I guess, to make it instinctive because you're out there, you're making a split second decision. And, and that's it, and, and training has to kick in. It's like, you know, people ask, well, why do you go to the farms range and, and you know, fire your weapon multiple times over and over? Because if, if I don't have that training and I get into a, a critical incident where I need to respond, I may not react appropriately. So I need that for that split second decision making that you know we're faced every day. And it's not just in a critical incident. It could be how we handle somebody yelling at us. So you know we and we, we train on that too. You know, what would be a proper response? We use things like verbal judo and such. So hmm. verbal judo, okay. Mm -hmm. Um I, I wanted to bring up Chris real quickly. You you studied forensic anthropology at U Tennessee. I did. What is that? I mean, is was that something that typically uh, is part of a career in law enforcement track, or did you want to be? Uh, did you want to go look for dinosaurs when you were a kid or something? Well, my degree is actually anthropology, and, and the emphasis was forensics. Uh, I had just a wonderful individual. I was one of his last students that he was an academic advisor for, and that was Dr. William Bass. Uh, he was the person who is well known uh, for the body farm. And I had the opportunity oh, sure. okay. as an undergraduate, uh, because he was my academic advisor, I was able to take uh, three graduate courses under him and uh, participate in activities. And I actually went out as part of his forensic response team. And it was, it was just an interesting topic for me to look at uh, the skeletal remains of something and be able to tell, you know, male, female, race, stature, you know, things like that. It, it, it was, it was and it translated well into the forensics for police department, but no, really, that undergraduate degree needed a master's and a PhD uh, for that field, and uh, I chose law enforcement, mm -hmm. so I kind of went totally opposite from my undergraduates. So. Mm -hmm. How much is law enforcement, you've been in, in about 18 years 18 now? 18 years. How much is law enforcement uh, 
achieved changed over that time? How much more scientific has it gotten? How much more do the people, even on foot patrol or whatever, how much more do they need to know about and to have the background in? Well, when I started, I got into a police car, and at the time we had what we called KDTs. And it was the old dot matrix type. It was a green letter that would pop up one letter at a time. And that, even for that time, it was state of the art because, you know, it used to be just radio. At, but now every officer has uh, an MCT now, a mobile computer terminal, with access to, you know, everything. Reports are automated. Crime analysis comes over that computer into the cars. Uh, the officers on bikes have handhelds where they can, you know, run tags. It's just amazing. But if law enforcement doesn't keep up that technology, the criminal element is going to exceed us because every time we improve on something, they learn from it and they improve on mm -hmm. something. And you know, crime now is is went cyber. We, you know, you know, the computer and the web itself has allowed criminals to reach from faraway countries into the city of Roanoke and to commit crimes. And so we've got to advance with that. And uh, the, the nice thing about the commitment of the city is that we understand that. You know, and our Department of Technology is, is well known, internationally known, uh, for its development of technology in our city. And so Roy Metcalf, the director of that, is, has been instrumental in helping the police department evolve with technology. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we have the, the equipment to state of art comparable to, you know, anywhere in the country. So it's got a couple of minutes left. But speaking of technology, you guys are using the department's using social media to get information on Facebook pages. That Absolutely. And, and that's part of the more open. I, I want the department to be more open. So to be more open, we've got to make sure we hit, you know, not just the TV and not just the print and the, the community meetings, but hit the net because a lot of people live on the net now. And so if we hit that with our social media, I think we can translate, you know, we, we t tweet from our geo meetings, which is kind of it's similar to a CompStat meeting uh, that New York City started back, you know, in the in the late 90s, and uh, so we tweet, you know, something's going on in the, in that community mm -hmm. or that zone. We'll put it out, and the citizen can know right away. You know, for instance, 67 percent of all the car larcenies, the car was left unlocked in the GPS on the dash. I hope that message gets out. Stop doing that, so right. we don't have that, because that's most of our criminals are opportunists mm -hmm. and take advantage. So we want that information out there. And that's when you can get out to the public, or you take your mobile command unit out and get information to them about about locking Absolutely. their cars. Absolutely, you know that big visible item creates curiosity. Let's walk over and see what's going on. If nothing else, we get them in there to show them the technology, and then we talk about the real issue, whether it's domestic violence or drug activity or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Real quickly, uh, excited about the future for the Roanoke City Police Absolutely. Department? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, when we get the command staff team put together, uh, we're going to be more of a collaborative uh, item and not just here's the uh, services side of the house and operations side of the house. We're going to collaborate on the entire department and uh, I see some great things coming. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Chris, uh, uh, Chief uh, Roanoke City Police Chief Chris Perkins, thank you very much for coming yes, on. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. This is the interview. I'm Gene Morano. We'll be right back.